teaching them now about your gospel and about your kingdom. We pray for your Holy Spirit to rest on them as they learn about you. Amen. When I was 13 and growing up in Harlow, Essex, just hours drive from here, um, one summer we were going off to Switzerland as a family. So we packed the car. Um, Not a very, well, it would have been a a car big enough for, let's have a look, by modern standards, five people. But we were a very big family. So we packed up the car, ready to go off to Switzerland, as we did every other year. And uh, coming up to leaving, uh, my older brother Stephen, who was 15 at the time, uh, didn't feel very well and started to throw up. And um, he, um, the doctor came round, had a look at him, he said he's fine, he's just nervous about the journey, so we're headed off to, to Dover. And um, I'm just re- reliving this in my imagination, how it would have been. My dad would have been driving, my mother had just passed her test, so they probably would have shared the driving. Uh, and then on the back seat, there would have been Stephen, my older brother, 15, me, Martin, 13, probably fighting. Um, uh, and then next to us, would have, might, me, would have been my sister Polly, and I would have definitely been giving her a hard time. She was about 11 and a half. And then there would have been Jamie, uh, who was five, and Katie, who was three. Illegal by today's standards. No safety belts, but that's how it was. And the, the roof would have been packed full of camping stuff and the, the boot as well. And so we headed off on this journey. Um, when we got to Dover, um, he still wasn't well, my, my older brother. And so we t- actually went to hospital and had him checked out. And they said, he's nothing wrong with him at all. Just fine, just go over the channel. You'll soon be in Switzerland. We crossed the channel and pitched our tents um, in a little town called berck sur mer which is not far from uh, Calais. And uh, in the morning, when I woke up, my brother Stephen wasn't there in the, my, our little tent, which we shared. He wasn't there next to me. So my dad came and said, oh, he'd fallen ill in the night and been taken to hospital and they'd operated him on, on him uh, for appendicitis. Um, some of you have heard this before. You'll see why I'm sharing it again now. So um, every day for two weeks, my parents would go to visit him, sometimes taking some of myself, my, myself and my younger sister, Polly, with me. Um, we'd go and visit Stephen in the hospital, and he was gradually getting worse and worse over a two-week period. And they finally decided in this little town hospital that they would have to have a final attempt to save his life and have an operation. That night, the... Um, The doctor, the surgeon, who happened to be married to the mayor of the town, uh, they took us into their house. The whole family obviously had pity on us. There we were camping in North France. And so, uh, and then um, in the morning, I remember my father coming into the room where I was sleeping and saying uh, very peacefully, that Stephen had died the night before and that his last words were obviously addressed to the French nurses and medical team. C'est merveilleux maintenant. It's wonderful now. And um, about five or six years ago, when I was involved in emptying my parents' house of stuff, uh, and, and involved in selling it because they, my father had died, my mother was in a home. Um, I discovered by the, the skirting board, hidden behind some shelves, a little packet of envelopes. And one of them was for the, from the French surgeon who'd operated on my brother Stephen. Um, and so I read this letter in French. And um, I, so, I suppose... She was quite an older doctor, a surgeon, so she'd probably seen a lot of operations and a lot of deaths, but something clearly had prompted her to write a little letter to us. 
and asking how we were. Um, my, my parents had obviously decided to hide all this material away. There were other documentation of my, son, my brother's uh, uh, death there, hidden away, almost as though they couldn't cope with it. But the letter said, um, had this phrase about my brother, il était tellement séduisant. He was, I don't know quite how to translate séduisant, but he was, he was so uh, um, beguiling, my, Stephen. Um, literally translated, it would be seductive, but it doesn't mean that. It means he, 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 um, he was such a sweet boy. Um, and we all lost the plot, the rest of us. We all pretty much lost our faith. Uh, two years later, I stopped going to church altogether when I was 15. It, it, it really had a devastating effect on the whole family. That We stayed together and kept trying to hack it. And I, I, I remember being told by my father what my, la my brother's last words had been. It's, it's wonderful now. And I didn't know what to do with it as a little boy of 30. I had no idea. What is this thing that's wonderful? What, what, did, what did he see or experience at his death? So I kind of stashed it away somewhere in my mind and didn't go there. But then, then some years, 10 years later, when I became a Christian one night in a service in a, in a church in London, um, and started to read the Bible, I came across these words. But Stephen, my brother's name was Stephen, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they, the Jewish people, covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here is Stephen. This is Acts chapter 7, uh, at the end of the chapter. Here is Stephen, who'd got the job of waiting at table because he was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Um, here is Stephen about to be executed by stoning, seeing Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And as I, as a young man growing up, reading these words as a, 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 a recently converted Christian, I thought maybe that's what my brother had seen. He'd seen something of heaven breaking in at his death. And I do believe that the Spirit prompted Wendy to come with that text from Simeon um, this morning. Here... From Acts chapter 2, we have Simeon in the temple with Anna. He knows he's not got long to live. He's way past his sell by date. And in this, Jesus is brought in as a little baby to be presented, presented, dedicated in the temple by Mary and Joseph. And Simeon recognizes in this baby the promised Messiah. And he says, now let your servant depart in peace, Lord, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He'd seen the salvation probably very shortly before he died. Now let your servant depart in peace. I'm ready to, to go to heaven now, to, to die, because I've seen what I've waited for all my life. Um, recently I've been reading the, uh, the writings of a guy called Richard Wurmbrandt 
Some of you may have heard of him. And um, he was a Christian who in the communist era was tortured by the, the communists for his Christian faith, for his witness to Jesus. And he writes this. Um, in the darkest hours of torture, the Son of Man came to us making the prison walls shine like diamonds and filling the cells with light. Somewhere far away were the torturers below us in the sphere of the body, but the Spirit rejoiced in the Lord. We would not have given up this joy for that of kingly palaces. When we frail and weak human beings are going through extreme duress, whether seeing a loved one dying or a loved one dying or uh, being tortured like that. I've never been through what this guy went through. But when people go through that kind of process, it seems to me that God often chooses to reveal something to them of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus began his, said his, in his first words that he, he, he spoke in, according to Mark's gospel in chapter 1 and verse 15 was, uh, repent and believe. Behold, the kingdom of God has come. It has come. It's not going to come one day when we've got our act together, but it has come. So Jesus was really saying, the kingdom of God now, in your seeing and hearing, um, is being realized. It is actively breaking into the present. When Jesus pitched up on earth, yeah, from his birth, um, the kingdom of God was breaking in. Sometimes in one translation, in another passage, it says it was forcibly advancing, moving forwards in power and strength. God breaking into this world. And at the point of seeming total catastrophe, sometimes this is most evident. My family was devastated by the loss of actually two sons, two brothers. Uh, it, we, you know, we kind of lost it, but a seed was planted in my heart. What did Stephen see at his death that was so wonderful? If that lady who tore this up when I dropped it in her letterbox yesterday had, would, were to see this, she would say, come running down to the church, tell me more, please. Something has to die, it seems to me, for us to really lay hold of what the kingdom of God is about. Jesus said, John chapter 12 and verse 24, Unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. A necessary death process, right at the heart of the gospel. Jesus, when he said that, was talking about his death that was going to come. Then he went on to say, John chapter 12 and verse 25, let's find it, went on to say, those who love their life will lose it, while those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in the kingdom of heaven, to break into this present realm. Now, what's interesting about Stephen the, in, the, in the gospel, not my brother Stephen, what is interesting is that the reason they stoned him to death is, what, is because he get, delivered a very long and erudite sermon just before they decided to, see, to, to, to stone him. He put them on the spot, and in this long sermon, it, Recorded in by Luke in Acts chapter 7, 
you have a look at verse 37, don't bother to look it up now unless you want to, he says this, addressing the Jews. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But, verse 39, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They turned back in their hearts to Egypt. They were on a journey, a long journey, a testing journey through the wilderness onto a promised land, Israel flowing with milk and honey, God's promised place for them. But in their hearts, they wanted to go back to Egypt. We're either being moving in any moment in time towards the kingdom of God, or we're moving backwards into the kingdom of this world. And the, one of the reasons they stoned Stephen was because he put them on the spot. And he said, you're going that way, not that way. And to go that way, you need to recognize that the one you crucified, Jesus, is Lord and King and promised Messiah, the one you've been waiting for. So when he saw Jesus, the right hand of, uh, of the Father, that was the ultimate blasphemy to them. That's why they took their stones and stoned him. Now what's really interesting here is that Luke records that there was a young man present at this stoning whose name was Saul. And Saul approved of this death, of this killing. In fact, interestingly, the uh, coats of the, of the men who stoned him, that they obviously taken off to be free to throw their stones, were placed at Saul's feet. And he kind of looked after their stone, their, 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 their coats. And just as God planted in my heart when I was 13, a seed, what is this wonderful thing that my brother Stephen saw when he died? I believe that God planted in the heart of this young man Saul a seed, which was later to come to fruition. Saul saw how Stephen died. He died full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit. Now Saul hadn't quite got it yet, understood what was going on, and he got on with the job of rounding up Christians and having them killed. The great persecution broke out at this point in Jerusalem, and many, many Christians from the whole area were rounded up by Saul and killed. Put in prison and then killed. Saul began to destroy the church, we read here. And I guess Saul must have seen how some of these Christians died. And I guess he must have began to gradually wonder whether he got it right or not. And then, of course, you know what happens to Saul. God had been already, I suggest, preparing him. And on the journey to Damascus, where he had, was going to round up the Christians of that town, round them up and have them put to death as well, the heavens opened. And a voice said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you? Jesus of Nazareth. The heavens opened. God spoke from beyond into this world, into Saul's life. He was struck blind, I think maybe dumb too. And as he worked out what had happened to him, having become a mass murderer of Christians, he became a fisher or a maker of Christians. Something had changed. A seed had been planted in his heart, I suggest, at the moment he saw how Stephen died when stoned by the Jews.
Now, it's really important, I think, that we do not think of the kingdom of heaven as being an otherworldly, surreal place with angels flapping around like this and singing lovely songs and um, uh, St. Peter and St. Paul uh, sitting on front seats and kingdom being some remote place way beyond this world which maybe one day after we have died we will be invited to get go. That is a misreading of Scripture. We need to distance ourselves from that kind of romantic understanding of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, from the word he breaks onto the scene, the kingdom of heaven is nigh. It is here. It is happening now, being realized. If only we have eyes to see, ears to hear what God is doing. Are you with me? Do you see what, where we're going with this? The kingdom of heaven is breaking in to this world. We pray, your kingdom, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth. But something has to die. Something has to die for this process to begin or to progress. That is why we find Paul... Do you remember whose name had been Saul, who'd been the murderer of Christians? Now the great apostle, the greatest apostle of all time, saying to the church in Corinth, chapter 4 and verse 7, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, Verse 10 now, we ca always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. We carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in your body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So death is at work in us but life is at work in you. I don't want to sound all kind of macabre and dark and just heavily into death, but clearly to gain life in all its fullness and to experience the breaking in of the kingdom of heaven, we have to understand the role that death has in it. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, do you remember what happened? Before going down deep into the waters of death, because that's the symbolism, right? you stay down in the water, you die, you drown. The symbolism you go is you go down into the deep waters of death. When that happened, the Gospels all tell us that the heavens were rent asunder, opened up. I wonder how that might have looked or felt. But they all say that the heavens opened up. It's a way of trying to capture in words that the kingdom of heaven was breaking into this world. At this point, this man was going to go down into the deep waters of death. Yeah? Paul, writing to the Colossian church, says that when you were baptized, you were baptized with him into his death. So that you might rise again with him into his resurrection life. Do you see the process? Okay. Now I just want to, th I started with this, telling you about what happened to my family and tried to explain how that's cashed out over the, over the many decades that followed for me. And what had been a tragedy came, became for me a vocation. And I just want to finish off by telling you what happened to me yesterday afternoon. I was in a house in Berry Park, and the tension had been growing by the day because the landlords wanted the family out because they couldn't pay any more rent, and they needed to decorate the whole place top to bottom. So. The, um, I was there at the time, and the, the, these, uh, the landlords and agents and all these people came in, 
there were lots of children sitting on the floor watching this happening, this very heated discussion. The reason the, the family couldn't move out was because they gathered together just enough money to be able to put down a rent and a deposit on another place, but the other place wasn't ready yet. They were desperate to move out, but they couldn't yet. They paid more money to stay longer in that place then they wouldn't have had the money to move out. You see the kind of moral tension of it. So this went on for about an hour and a half, this increasingly heated debate, and phone calls went, and more and more important uh, Muslim people came into the room, and then finally a guy with a looked like an imam came in, and he said, who are you? <laughs> I, said, I stood up and said, I'm the pastor of their church, trying to help resolve this, and we need to try and find a way to resolve it. I don't know what it is. So we looked at all the different options, and um, we couldn't find any solution because they say they've got to go now. That's actually technically illegal to evict a family without the proper legal process, but they thought that was to go that way. Meanwhile, all through this, the little children were sitting on the floor looking, listening, what's going on. And finally, I said, I said to uh, the kind of head of it, I said, look, they'll have to move in with me. Now, that was a big risk. <laughs> I did know in the back of my mind that Margaret is in Switzerland. <laughs> so, please, don't say anything. But I also knew in the back of my mind that probably what would happen is one of the other families there in the room would say, look, just come in with us. So it was all resolved like that. Now, the, reason I'm, the only reason I'm telling you this is that what happened at that point is everyone melted. And the guys who were clearly glad that the, we found they'd found a solution, could get on with decorating the house and move on, they said to me, we want to come to your church. Because if that's what Christians do, we want to come. We, we want to see, where, where's the address? So I gave him my card, eventually found a card, gave it to him. Is he here? No, he's not. Maybe he one day he'll come. But the reason he said, and then the imam kind of bloke said, I'm really sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that, for, for, for that. And for me, that was the kingdom of God breaking in. It could lead to a divorce if they'd moved in, but, <laughs> but um, in, in that moment in time, it, it, which would be morally confusing, uh, <laughs> but at that moment in time, I, it seemed the right thing to do. Uh, and thank you for not saying anything to Margaret when she comes back in a week's time. No. <laughs> right. So, okay, I'm glad we're finishing this very heavy talk with some laughter, but I just think that's the kind of way the kingdom of God breaks into the present and the here and now. What might have been was getting increasingly potentially violent situation with people in tears and getting increasingly threatened was dissolved by simply saying something ever so simple and practical. And that may be the kingdom of God breaking in. Now we're going to sing another song, and then we're going to have communion. And we're going to remember that when Jesus broke the bread and drank the wine, yeah, don't all go quiet now, just please get this. There is a... Don't just have your conversations and think, oh, well, we'll just have communion now. It's, no, no, please. When Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, yes, and when he told us to do this to remember him, yeah, he was saying that if you really want to have life, you need to understand what happens when I die. Yeah? My blood is going to be poured out for all of you, that you might be forgiven and the kingdom of God break in in all its fullness. So when you drink this cup, 
you're remembering my death. And when you eat this bread, you're eating of me and I'm coming to live in you. So death and life, like two sides of the same coin, inseparable from each other. Lord God, we pray that as we receive the sacrament in a moment, you would become even more real to us than you are right now. For we love you. And we know that before we loved you, you loved us. Amen.